All right, so before we get into Dewey, I want to read a kid's book. I think she does a pretty good job of articulating what Dewey is getting at here. The book is I Know the Moon. I mean, it's got the word no in the title. Hello. It's going to appeal to me, of course. Obviously, it's a work of philosophy, not just for kids. <clears throat> I Know the Moon. The night creatures came to the mossy place in the deep, formed a silent circle, and saw the moon. I know the moon, said the fox. I know the moon is a rabbit, swift and large and glowing. We play a merry game of chase in and out of cloudy rabbit holes. No rabbit is her equal, and I'll not catch her soon. That is how I know the moon. The moon is not a rabbit, laughed the moth. I know the moon is a cocoon, a place where moths of legend are born and fly like stars to light the sky. The great moth moon danced, light as air, and bowed low on a golden leaf. Cocoon, that is how I know the moon. No, said the owl, it's not a cocoon. It is a window cut through the night like the hollow of a tree. I see the light fly out and soar away and return to roost with the morning. The owl blinked slowly and stretched his wings. A window in a midnight room. That is how I know the moon. The moon is not a window, said the mouse. It is a seed planted deep in night soil. It blooms a sunflower by day and warms my back and slips to seed again at dusk. It is a seed in endless bloom. That is how I know the moon. Oh, I got a frame, I'm sorry. I know the moon's not a seed, croaked the bullfrog. It is a lily pad, a golden lily pad that glistens in every pond and puddle. From there I can admire my reflection and feed on fireflies that wing about. A lily pad for froggy croons. That is how I know the moon. The animals, each convinced that he alone knew the moon, began to bicker. Soon their voices grew sharp and tangled and glints of tooth and claw and angry eyes flashed in the night. Enough, screeched the owl. There is but one moon. We shall have but one answer. The man of science. He reads the rings of trees, the stars at night, sunset colors, black on white. Surely he will know the moon. So they trotted and fluttered and scampered and hopped and flapped their way to him. The man of science lived alone with his thoughts in a tower high enough to almost touch the moon. Almost. He invited them in and seated them in a row according to width and breadth and height. In turn, each animal told him of its moon, then pleaded, please tell me that my moon is right. The man plucked a squarish book from his narrow shelf. The moon, I understand, is a barren ball of sand. I know the width, I know the breadth, I know the height. It is dust, it is cold, it is, or sorry, it is dust, it is old, it is crust, it is cold. Facts and figures, all in orbit. Read the moon, then absorb it. To be sure, the moon is that and nothing more. The night creatures crept curiously to the book. They sniffed it. They squinted, they stared. The inky pages said not a word. Their moon simply was not there. You see, said the man, it takes many words to know the moon. With that, he closed the book soundly. I really thank you all for calling, but I really can't be dawdling. There's still so much to learn. Now, now good night. The animals thanked him politely and slipped sadly into the darkness. The path home was silent. Far away now, the fox's voice swept away the cool night hush. It takes more than words to know the moon. It must be chased and felt and seen. The man says it's made of letters. I know it's more the spaces in between. 
the other animals listened and understood. I know the moon's a cocoon, said the moth, not a ball of sand. A night window, said the owl, much more than dust. A seed in bloom, said the mouse, certainly more than crust. Not simply cold, but a lily pad, said the bullfrog. The fox smiled, a rabbit, he said, not a nothing. No, they said together, never a nothing. The night creatures came to the mossy place in the deep wood, formed a silent circle, and saw the moon again. So instead of the moon, Dewey talks about the horse. It's the same idea. The postulate of immediate empiricism. Again, empiricism not mediated, mediated by mind. Mind comes later. Mind comes after the fact. We're talking about immediate, right now, in the moment empiricism. And what type of knowledge can that give us? And is there any other type of knowledge out there besides immediate empiricism? So this is John Dewey. Immediate empiricism postulates that things, and by that we mean the ordinary sense of the word, not some overly philosophical thing. We're just talking about stuff, man. Just things out there, okay? are what they are experienced as. The moon is a lily pad. The moon is a hole. The moon is a cocoon. Those are all the things the moon is. You know what the moon isn't? A ball of sand. The man of science is really like Rudolf Carnap. Give me a definition of the thing. I can point to it. Right? The man of science is close enough to almost touch the moon and doesn't even look out the window. He goes to his bookshelf to describe and explain what the moon is instead of any type of experience of it. No experiential knowledge here. Experience is not justification. What's justification is go look at a book. Let's find the definition. This is what it is. Not through my own experience. It's going much more universal, right? The animals all have their own particular experience of it, but where's the universality? A cocoon is not a seed. A seed is not a rabbit. A rabbit is not a lily pad. These things, we have but one moon, then we shall have but one answer. We can't all experience it differently. That's just crazy talk. Or is it? Dewey goes on. Again, not the moon. He's talking about a horse, but the same thing applies to, this, to the book as well. Things are what they are experienced as. So the moon is a seed. Hence, if one wishes to describe anything truly, his task is to tell what it is experienced as being. If it is a horse that is to be described, or the ecus that is to be defined, then must the horse trader, or the jockey, or the timid family man who wants a safe driver, or the zoologist, or the paleontologist tell us what the horse is, which is experienced. There's but one horse who's got the right answer, who has the true horse, who has the noumenal horse. To go back to Kant and get philosophical for a second. I try not to, but occasionally I need to. Right? The thing in itself, who's closer to the horse as it actually is? If these accounts turn out different in some respects, as well as congruous in others, this is no reason for assuming the content of one to be exclusively real and that of the others to be phenomenal. For each account of what is experienced will manifest that it is the account of the horse dealer or of the zoologist, and hence will give the conditions requisite for understanding the differences as well as the agreements of the various accounts. The principle varies not a whit if we bring the psychologist's horse, the logician's horse, the metaphysician's horse. There is a horse out there. And all aspects of this thing are partial descriptions of the actual horse. Everyone's just highlighting and focusing on different aspects. None of them are wrong. All of them are partially right. Dewey here, especially early Dewey of the early 1900s, and this is very early Dewey, 
very influenced by Hegel. Extremely Hegelian. Not so much Kantian, right? He's kind of poo-pooing the whole noumenal phenomenal distinction thing. He's Hegelian. Look, the horse dealer is going to have aspects of truth. The guy, the father looking for a safe driver for his kid is going to have aspects of truth. But none of them are going to have full and complete truth of the horse. It's always going to be limited by their own perspective. But that also doesn't mean that they're false. It doesn't mean that they're wrong. There's not one real horse, and all the rest of these are just phenomenal horses or approximations to the one true horse. They're all real. The horse really is a safe driver. The horse really is a good investment or whatever it is. It's what the horse really is, because that's what the horse is being experienced as. Experience is justification. In each case, the nub of the question is what sort of experience is denoted or indicated. What we have then, a contrast, right, where they disagree, because they're going to agree on a lot of stuff too. Where they agree probably does get us closer to the noumenal or real or truest horse. But where they disagree, those things are just as real and just as true. So what we have then in the contrast, not between a reality and various approximations of, but between different reels of experience. Dewey's not so much concerned about truth with a big old capital T. He's not so concerned with Oh my goodness, we've got to get to the ding on Zeke, the thing as it actually is, the subject-object relationship. No, no, no. A real subject-object relationship is more about meaning and significance. So notice the how this would contrast with um, not Getty, the other guy, Carnap. Right? Who wants to talk about one definite meaning, definition, blah, blah, blah. No, 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 no. Right? He wants to get away from Tevi. Dewey's like, no, 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 man, embrace Tevi. Right? Embrace this, these multiple perspectives. Embrace the, yeah, it's true, and yet at the same time, not quite. Embrace the meaningful significance more so than truth. And that's sort of what Heidegger does, too, if you remember, right? Heidegger's not so concerned about truth. He's more concerned about truth for me. Not that there isn't objective truth. He's not doing the purely subjective thing. But he is saying that what's more significant is what's it mean for me? What's it mean for me to be? And then that get, then gives some insight into being, more generally speaking. But it's about what, what's it mean for me to exist? What's it mean for my life? What does this mean for me? What can I get out of this? So in some ways, it's been claimed that Heidegger is sort of making all of us the absolute. Right, what do I get out of it? But anyways, this is Dewey, not Heidegger. There, there are connections here. So what we have is different reels of experience. It's fallacious then to say, so this is the next page, um, and I'm reading from a, a copy from the, um, the Essential Dewey, so the page numbers will be all out of whack depending upon where you found the version you read. This is the second page. Um, Let's see, one, two, three, fourth paragraph of the article. It's fallacious to say that reality is just and exclusively what is, what it is, or would be to an all-competent, all-knower. Right, then in part what's happening with this noumenal realm that Kant's talking about is this, an, an omniscient perspective, the all-seeing, all-knowing perspective. What would the couch look like? The couch is in the background here in my basement. What would the couch look like? Dewey's not so worried about that. He's like, no, no, no. What's the couch mean for me? What's the significance for me? What's my real interaction and real experience with the thing? It's about experience and subjective experience, not poo-pooing objective truth. That's nice. And he'll talk later, pardon me, in one of the footnotes um, about, look, I can't just, somewhat like Barclay, I can't just decide, oh, hey, I've had an experience of a UFO, so it must have been true. Mm, not exactly. There's still got to be a thing out there that is that I'm capable of having experience with. The UFO might just be something up here that I imagine, not an actual thing out there that I had experience with. Now, again, I do still have an experience, 
but it's a very different type of experience if it's all up here. But back to the early part of this article. And it, what's also interesting, let me point this out at this point, the journal that this was published in, this is 1905, so this is kind of the early days of academic journals and before they all started breaking off and doing their own thing. This was first published in the Journal of Philosophy, Psychology, and Scientific Methods. But these were all one and the same thing. Philosophy was psychology. Psychology was science. All of these things had to do with method. Hmm. Interesting. And so here he's telling us, and this is harkening back to Berkeley as well, Dewey and Dewey, in his own unique way, is doing what Kant did, kind of tying bows and tying together a lot of these philosophers like Descartes and Locke and Hume and Berkeley. <clears throat> Knowing is one mode of experiencing. Just one. There are other modes of experiencing. And philosophy, Dewey thinks, has focused too much on the knowing aspect. Knowledge is justified, true belief, and all of that. What about other ways of of experiencing the world. What about meaning and significance instead of truth and knowledge? Hmm. Knowing is one mode of experiencing. And the primary philosophic demand is to find out what sort of experience knowing is. So philosophy is about figuring out knowledge. But it's about figuring out knowledge within the context of life and experience, not something separate and apart from life and experience. So then he gives this example of the window shade, at the bottom of this particular column in, in, in my reading. I think this is about the fifth paragraph. I start and am flustered by a noise heard. Empirically, that noise is fearsome. It really is. Not merely phenomenally or subjectively so, it's fearsome. That's what it's experienced as being. But when I experience the noise as a known thing, I find it to be innocent of harm. So remember Heidegger talked about inquiry being guided by that thing which is sought. Do we say that same thing here? Look, you're laying in bed, right, and you finally got the worries of the world out of your head so that you can go to sleep, you're sleeping peacefully, and then, whoa, an unknown noise. Not only does the unknown noise wake you up, but it also forces you to explore, it pushes you into inquiry. You've got to go figure out what the noise was to know whether you should do something about the noise or just go back to sleep. You don't know it yet. The knowledge is going to come later. You're trying to figure it out. But even while you're figuring it out, you're still having an experience, and that experience is not knowledge. That experience is something else. You experience it first as fear. Knowledge is going to come later. The emotional stuff happens first, the intellectual stuff happens second. So this is somewhat like what Barclay talked about, right? The Ordo Amoris, to, talk, to, to reference Max Scheler, right? The car passes by, you care about it, that's why then you want to know what the thing was, or jewelry, or whatever the case is. You have the emotional content first, then the intellectual stuff comes in. This noise is fearsome. You get up to explore what the heck is this thing. Experience, then knowledge later. So the thing is fearsome, it really is. Then, when you experience it as a known thing, so now you have knowledge, you got up, you explored, you figured out what it was. Oh, okay. Now the next time you hear it, you're not afraid of it. That doesn't erase the first fear that you had when it was unknown. It doesn't change the past, it merely shapes the future. When I experience the noise as a known thing, I find it to be innocent of harm. The tapping of a shade against the window, owing to the movements of the wind. The experience, the second time, has changed. Not the first time. Okay, go back and rewrite the past. The first time it was steer, still fearful. Right? I still had the fear that was an actual experience that I had. Then I did the inquiry. That was the impetus for the inquiry. I figured out what it was, then went back to bed, then the next time, the next experience when I hear it, oh yeah, I don't need to get up and explore. I already know what that is. It's a known thing. Now I'm not afraid. This is not a crossing out like Heidegger's talking about. This is 
the second experience, right? We're always moving forward for doing, we're not looking back. We're moving forward. The thing experienced has changed. Before it was fearful, now it's not. Not that an unreality has given place to a reality. Not that some transcendental reality has changed. No, no, no. Not that truth has changed. It was always true that it was the blinds hitting against the window or whatever. That was always the truth of the situation. Truth didn't change. My experience has changed. My experience of that truth, the significance has changed. The experience of the next one is different than the one previous. That's what's changed. Just and only the concrete reality experienced has changed. Reality, not truth. This is a change of experienced existence affected through the medium of cognition. The content of the latter experience cognitively regarded is doubtless truer than the content of the earlier. It's truer, but it's no more real truth and real experience not necessarily the same thing here says Dewey which again is why this is kind of an evasion of Western philosophy it's sort of taking a roundabout instead of a straight through path philosophy is going the straight through path where we got to be truth and knowledge and blah 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 and he's like no 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 what about experience here experience truth may be an aspect of that but there's other modes of experiencing besides just knowledge Let's explore those. Let's explore methods more so than a set standard of criteria. Mm -hmm. I think I already referenced William James' Perchings and Flights. If I didn't, then mention that in the discussion board so I can talk about that in the future because that's sort of building off part of what Dewey's doing here as well, this inquiry, right? You're in the nest of certainty. You get pushed out by the window blinds. Now you gotta fly, and you're flying not just for the sake of flying, but you're flying with an intended purpose of finding the next branch, next nest that you can rest in, that resting certainty. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Two little words. So here's some of the Humean influence. And he's already sort of anti-philosophy philosopher here. And I don't even know that Dewey would necessarily consider himself a philosopher first and foremost. And typically where Dewey is discussed is in education fields, not in the field of philosophy. There are very few universities, even here in the United States, that specialize in American philosophy because that's still not really taken seriously as philosophy. It's something else. It's an evasion of rather than actually doing. <clears throat> These two little words, through words, through explication of which the empiricist position may be brought out, as and that. Remember, for Hume, the matters of fact, we all experience as if they are certain. We perhaps intellectually know that they're not, we know it's probability, but we experience them as if. Just like, come on man, these animals are idiots. Right? The frog knows it's not actually, truly a lily pad. That's how he's experiencing it. That's how he sort of internalizes the knowledge of the thing. The moon, to me, is a lily pad. I know you, Al, are not going to understand it that way. Right? I'd have to describe it a different way for you, but this is the way that I understand. This is the way that I experience it. The moon, for me, is a lily pad. And this is what the lily pad then does. The moon does those things. The moon just isn't truly a lily pad. And so what? Why, why does the owl care? It doesn't infringe upon at all upon how the owl experiences it. This obsession with truth is perhaps part of the problem, not part of the solution. Someone like Dewey would say, a pragmatist would say, that the truth is something practical rather than some idealistic thing out there. So as 
that. Remember the that's and the this is go back to Aristotle. I experience this window blind and this couch and this and this and this. The question of truth is not as to whether being or non-being, reality or mere appearance is experienced, but as to the worth of a certain concretely experienced thing. Again, what does it mean? What's the significance, not what's true? <clears throat> so there are woods at the end of the street here where I live. It's, it's, it's not even woods, it's just some woods. Right, that separate this little community from the schools on the other side of the trees. Probably about four houses wide, okay, not a lot. And so my nephew is, is of that age where he's oddly fascinated and also frightened by snakes. If I were to lie to him, tell him a non-truth, something which does not correspond to actual reality and say there are snakes in, that, in those woods, he will not go into the woods. It will keep him safe. It has practical implications. It's a, it's useful. Is it true? No. Is it useful? Yes. Is it functional? Yes. And that's the point of truth, says the pragmatist. It's meant to be functional. Whether it corresponds or not, who cares? And quite frankly, who the heck even knows? There may be snakes there. I don't know. But it keeps him safe. It keeps him out of the woods. So it works. Truth is what works in the pragmatist sense. From the postulate of empiricism, then. So this is right before the, the notes. From the postulate of empiricism, then. Nothing can be deduced, not a single philosophical proposition. That's weird. There's a philosopher telling us that philosophical propositions can't be deduced. And deduction, of course, is the whole thing for Carnap. I can very close to the screen. I need to scooch the thing back more. I don't need to. It doesn't need to be extreme close-up time. See all the wrinkles and stuff in my face. <clears throat> The reader may hence conclude that all this just comes to the truism that experience is experience, or is what it is. If one attempts to draw conclusions from the bare concept of experience, the reader is quite right. But the real significance of this principle is that of a method of philosophical analysis. It's about the method, not about the answers. It's about the questions to get us there. It's about the way in which we think. Philosophy is method more so than a set of propositions, says the pragmatist. And this method is identical in kind with that of the scientist. Remember the journal, Philosophy, Psychology, and Scientific Methods. The scientific method is the philosophical method. The philosophical method is the psychological method. The psychological method is the scientific method. They're all the same method. If you wish to find out what subjective, objective, physical, mental, cosmic, psychic, cause, substance, purpose, activity, evil, being, quality, any philosophical term, what they mean, go to experience and see what the thing is experienced as. <coughs> So then the notes. This essay is not a denial of the necessity of me mediation or reflection in knowledge, but it is an assertion that the inferential factor must exist, must occur, and that all existence is direct and vital so that philosophy can pass upon its nature only by first ascertaining what it exists or occurs as. He's not saying don't think about stuff. He's not saying don't mediate. He's not saying stop at immediate. He's saying let's recognize that it begins with immediate. And all that that entails, emotions and all that stuff, begins with the immediate. Then comes to the mediated. Then comes to the knowledge part. Fear is first. Inquiry comes after. We experience most things as temporarily prior to our experiencing of them. 
This is one of my favorite things that Dewey ever says, this line right here. The second footnote. All labels, of course, are obnoxious and misleading. The labels should be starting points for discussion, but frequently are end points for discussion. Because we presume what all the isms mean. Oh, you label yourself as that? Well, that means da 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 Oh, you label yourself a Republican. That means you believe da 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 Label yourself a Democrat. That means you believe da 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 Label yourself as a God believer. Da 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 Non God believer. Da 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 Questioner. Da 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 Philosopher. Da 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 We hear one word and already associate a whole bunch of other stuff that may or may not fit with that particular person's definition of that term. And so it says again about subjective experience. There's not a definition to, well, think about gender. Male, female. You don't know what I mean when I say male, and that's okay. You don't know what I mean when I say female, and that's okay. Right? My wife and I fulfill traditional gender roles in reverse. I'm a vegetarian, statistically in the minority, because most vegetarians are females. I'm because of my funky schedule, more the stay-at-home parent, not just now in current conditions, but even when I'm teaching and so forth, because I'm typically home when the kids get home. So I'm the one that does most of the cooking, most of the cleaning, most of the laundry, so on and so forth. I don't grill. I have a fear of fire. My wife does the grilling. I'm the one preparing the salads and baking cookies. She makes more than twice the amount that I do. Thank goodness, or we wouldn't have a basement that I could broadcast this thing from, right? And so all of these, so does that mean that I'm the female then? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, that's more, probably more of an ethics question than a philosophy question, but it does pertain to some philosophical issues as well, which maybe we'll get to the last week of class. And so here's where the UFO thing comes in, the very last footnote. So given everything else he's said, excepting, of course, some negative ones, one could say that certain views are certainly not true, because by hypothesis they refer to non-entities. But even here, the empiricist must go very slowly. From his own standpoint, even the most professedly transcendental statements are, after all, real as experiences, and hence negotiate some transaction with facts. For this reason, he cannot reject them in toto, but has to show concretely how they arose and how they are to be corrected. So think again about the connection with psychology. Right? It's not discounting the experience that you're having. It's merely pointing out, look, there's not a real thing out there that you were having experience of. It's up here instead. And then we get into proofs about existence and so on and so forth. You know, how do I prove that my pony exists when we talk about Barclay and the senses and all of that? So again, this kind of connects a lot of stuff together. So Dewey then lays the groundwork for a whole lot of philosophy to follow as well. So for example, um, I don't think I've referenced this before, but I may have with the post-truth stuff, in which case, sorry, you can stop watching now. If not, then uh, keep watching. This is Michael Polia Polanyi. P-O-L-A-N-Y-I. This is a book he wrote in 1967 called The Tacit Dimension. Now he's talking about the philosophy of science. So was Dewey. The scientific method is the philosophical method. And again, since this is the late 1960s, every book, even philosophy of science books, are also political treatises as well. Because everything is political in the late 1960s, early 1970s. And says so comes from um, the chapter entitled A Society of Explorers. Dewey talks about communities of inquirers, but same general idea. Polanyi says, My account of scientific discovery describes an existential choice. So a choice about existence itself. We start the pursuit of discovery by pouring ourselves into the subsidiary elements of a problem. And we continue to spill ourselves into further clues as we advance further so that we arrive at discovery fully committed to it as an aspect of reality. We don't just 
halfway get up out of bed to go explore something. We fully commit to finding out what it is, or we fully commit to not finding out what it is. We either get up out of the bed at the noise, or we don't. We're fully committed. We're all in. Good science is all in, devoting everything to the inquiry so that the discovery then has some significance at the end. It's not just a thought experiment. Descartes wasn't invested enough in the doubt that he's talking about. So say the pragmatists and others. So then the arrival of, oh wow, I'm me, the thinking things, only thing I can be certain of, doesn't have the same significance, the same meaning, the same experience, because it was all just kind of up here anyway. <coughs> These choices then create in us, back to Polanyi, create in us a new existence. These discoveries then change us because we're fully committed to the inquiry. This new existence then challenges others to transform themselves into its image. To this extent, then, existence precedes essence. That is, it comes before the truth that we establish and make our own. Again, truth isn't just this thing out here. Truth is something which we need to internalize. We talked about that early, early, early on when I gave you those Ten Commandments of Philosophy, like the first couple of days of the class. We'll also see it again in the future, especially with regards to Soren Kierkegaard about making objective truth more subjective in order for the truth to matter. It's good stuff, man. So Paul Dianyi goes on. Any tradition fostering progress of thought must have this intention, to teach its current ideas as stages leading on to unknown truths, which when discovered might dissent from the very teachings which engendered them. And again, Karl Popper is the philosopher I'm thinking about here, and his, he has an excerpt in the textbook in the Philosophy of Science section, which says the point of science is to break science. That's how we make new discoveries, push things to the breaking point, because we haven't arrived all the way at the end yet. Progress is still real. Progress is still happening, but progress only happens when things break. If everything's fine, you never progress. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. So it's got to break first somewhat Heideggerian as well, right? The rupture, the, these, uh, this breaking of the hockey stick and so forth is an opportunity for new, an opportunity for new reflection, an opportunity for betterment. Back to Polanyi. Such a tradition then assures the independence of its followers by transmitting the conviction that thought has intrinsic powers to be evoked in men's minds by intimations of hidden truths. It respects the individual for being capable of such response, for being able to see a problem not visible to others and to explore it on his own responsibility. Such are the metaphysical grounds of intellectual life in a free, dynamic society. He's not talking just about science now. He's talking about society grander and greater than that. And Dewey says that all of philosophy is philosophy of education, that if your philosophy does not have an educational component to it, then it's not real philosophy. And so, he's also a big fan of this community of inquirer things, kind of more like the Montessori model, where children are necessarily naturally curious, and so let's foster that curiosity, let's give them the tools so that they can find the answers on their own instead of just giving them answers. That there should be much more discussion taking place at the K through 12 level, not just I'm the expert, I have all of the answers. Write this down, children, in a week or so I'll ask you to write it back to me. That's not education, that's not teaching people how to think. And thinking, Dewey thinks, yeah, thinking, Dewey thinks, is essential to democracy itself. So then we get into the post-truth stuff that we talked about previously. Back to Polanyi. In this society of explorers, man is in thought. Man, the explorer, is placed in the midst of potential discoveries which offer him the possibility of num numberless problems. Right? All these discoveries are going to lead to more problems, so on and so forth. Right? 
every new nest you're going to get pushed out of and have to find a new nest to go back to the tree analogy then. And this, what Polanyi says here in 1967, harkens back really to what Emerson, Ralph Waldo Emerson, talked about in his essay, um, the address that he gave to Harvard, the American scholar, <clears throat> where he talks about man thinking. That you can have man thinking anywhere in any context, not just at Harvard. He's calling Harvard out at Harvard's graduation. Thinking can happen anywhere. Farmer can be man thinking. But the flip side of that is also true. Harvard thinker could also not actually be thinking. He could just be regurgitating. And so Emerson then, in his exemplary persons, says, look, we should model their behavior, model their methods, not model their answers. Right? That we need to take ownership of our own intellectual discovery and development here, especially in the United States. Emerson says we're still beholden to the truths of Europe, <clears throat> even though most of his exemplary persons are European, but that's just historical oddities. Polanyi then goes on, this is the very end of the essay here. It is the image of humanity immersed in potential thought that I find revealing for the problems of our day. It, riot, it rids us of the absurdity of absolute self-determination, yet offers each of us the chance of creative originality within the fragmentary area which circumscribes our calling. It provides us with the metaphysical grounds and the organizing principle of the society of explorers. Yet the question remains whether this solution will satisfy us. Can we recognize the limitations it imposes on us? Must not such a fragmented society appear adrift, irresponsible, selfish, apparently chaotic? I've praised the freedom of a community where coherence is spontaneously established by self-coordination. Authority is exercised by equals over each other. All tasks are set by each to himself. But where are they all going? Nobody knows. They're just piling up works soon to be forgotten. I've tried to affiliate our creative endeavors to the organic evolution from which we have arisen. So here he's tying art into it too. Creativity. Science is as much art as it is science. Says Polanyi. But its products were mainly plants and animals that could be satisfied with brief existence. Men need a purpose which bears on eternity. Truth does that. Our ideals do it. And this might be enough if we could ever be satisfied with our manifest moral shortcomings and with a society which has such shortcomings fatally involved in its workings. Perhaps this problem cannot be resolved on secular grounds alone, but its religious solution should become more feasible once religious faith is related least from pressure by an absurd vision of the universe, and so there will open up instead a meaningful world which would resound to religion. And I mentioned that last part, those last couple paragraphs, to lay the groundwork for Bertrand Russell, who's going to come towards the end of our discussion on belief. And so, yeah, so much more to be said there. Um, Poliani, in some ways, is also sort of foreshadowing what Cornell West says. So back to Cornell West again. Cornell West says that a society, a democracy, should really kind of be like a jazz band, where each person, each individual, has the opportunity to be highlighted, to be creative, to have their own solo, but it's within the framework of the band, right? Within the framework of the, the work of music. And then everyone kind of has their starting point and end point they can be creative in the midst of but we've got to come back to the band part so it's not just individuals next to each other it's actually a community but it's a community which also embraces individuality as well um, and towards the end of the course I'll send out a link to um, a YouTube video from the examined life that where Cornell West talks about some other stuff too but I want to do it at the end because he kind of references almost everybody else we've done in the class which is really cool um, so that's it for Polyanyi, that's sort of it for pragmatism. Um, and pragmatism has a long, long history. And in some ways it's post-post-truth, some have claimed. So it's sort of the philosophy of the 21st century, some have claimed. Shropi's not necessarily claiming that, I'm just letting you know, some have claimed that. Um, so for next time then, we're going to start moving towards the belief aspect. And we'll start talking about God. We'll talk about God in the philosophical sense, not in the religious sense. And so I'll set up certain parameters and so forth, and we'll be reading Aquinas, Anselm, 
Pascal and Kierkegaard to represent the God-believing folks. Then we'll read Nietzsche and Russell to represent the non-God-believing folks. And so, yeah, that's enough for now. See you next time. Actually, I won't see you. You'll see me, but you know what I mean.